Yeah. So it became evident to me when Wojtek was giving his talk that we still need a refresher on this. <clears throat> so some people, apparently Wojtek, believe that GPL v3 requires disclosure of signing keys in a lockdown environment. And I believe he's not alone among the room. So I'd like to take some time in my talk to go over this and explain how we got around this and what the solution is. And actually, this might take us to 20 minutes. Then we can have tea, and then we can come back and discuss the unification. So part of the object of what the Linux Foundation has been doing is to get around this problem that was identified almost immediately when Secure Boot came along. We first of all tried to fix it in the Windows 8 logo requirements. So we actually had, it wasn't quite a private negotiation with Microsoft. We negotiated by press briefing. But we explained all of the problems with GPL v3 and produced a set of systems we thought would actually escape from the GPL v3 key disclosure requirements. Um, the only real requirement that GPL v3 has that actually forces disclosure of the keys is that the end user be able to modify and reboot their system. If they can't do that, you have to disclose the signing keys that allow them to do that. And that means that as long as you have the capability of ejecting the preset keys and installing your own, you can actually build a system that is identically equivalent to the one that was shipped to you with your own keys, and it's just as secure and just as everything else. So reset to setup mode that we got Microsoft to agree to, or rather, I think they were fairly willing to agree in their first draft. It's just the way they phrased it didn't quite correspond to what we needed for, the S to, for GPL v3. Satisfies this GPL v3 um, obligation. And the FSF has issued a statement saying that they support this. This means that in the current Windows 8 logo requirements for any machine that is absolutely conformant to those requirements. And in theory, for any that's not, Microsoft will cause that machine to be revoked and the firmware to be rewritten. GPL v3 is not a problem. Peter. Yeah, this is x86 only. Obviously, the ARM lockdown is completely GPL v3. Not, but, but if you're using GPL v3 code in a lockdown phone, you have other problems. So uh, all I care about is GPL v3 in the x86 ecosystem. Right, so Matthew's point is that it's actually the people who ship a physical product who are in jeopardy of the GPL v3 key disclosure. Right, and the, 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 the actual specific problem was Canonical wanted to ship a, a computer. Okay, does anybody have any further questions about GPL v3? Does everybody understand that in spite of all the FUD, it's no longer a problem. And I can show you exactly why it isn't a problem, if I can get. Yeah, I mean, we are shipping systems. We do have security on them. We make sure that the firmware is correct, so it's not a problem for us. OK. Uh, I would say it's a source of problem. <laughs> So here's my own bootloader. This is actually, this is my uh, EFI one. But what we'll actually do is look at the, go. Oh, sorry, I won't be able to do this. I'm just enrolling the key for the key tool. So if you look at this system that just booted, the keys in here are actually the Microsoft keys. That's the Microsoft UFI CA. Uh, this is the weird, I don't know what the PCA key is, but it's one they require to be present. And then it also has Microsoft keys and the key exchange key. The only difference about this is that the platform key is my key. And the reason this is useful is because I can do this. This is the thing that actually allows me to satisfy the SFSF because I have just, see, platform and setup mode, secure boot is off. I've just programmatically disabled secure boot in my system. That's what the FSF wants. Okay, 
Any questions about this? Right. Okay, so the concern is that the Microsoft logo requirements specify that a compliant implementation would obviously comply with GPL v3, but a non-compliant one wouldn't. And the question in the case of a non-compliant one is that who's in jeopardy for, for having the key disclosed, right? And if you look at what I just did, if you disclose the platform key, which is the OEM's key, their responsibility, they're on the hook for this. So an OEM who ships a non-compliant distribution, Microsoft is supposed to be shooting them, and even if Microsoft doesn't shoot them, the key that's in jeopardy is their platform key, not anything else. The only person in jeopardy is the shipper. But once you've loaded markets, transitioning to its own route of security. And as Matthew says, the person who's in jeopardy is the shipper. Somebody who ships a non-compliant piece of hardware with something in GPL v3 bears the responsibility of making it work. Yes, but still, if you are preloading an operating system on a hardware, there are contracts between you and the shipper of the hardware that probably... Wouldn't there be a little... Wouldn't there be a little clause in that contract that said Windows 8 logo requirement and your pre-hardware testing would pick this up and you would send it back to the manufacturer? <laughs> Okay. Okay, so you want T now if there are no more questions about GPL v3? Yeah, yeah then we'll come yeah, back we'll to the... We'll break early and come back on, on schedule time. Okay, okay. So, we begin with the talk that was actually scheduled to give rather than the GPL v3 one that was an impromptu one, which was the architectural problems with our current shim approach. Um, basically, a lot of the new bootloaders, specifically Gummy Boot, um, don't work by linking the next stage themselves. This is how shim works. This is how it escapes from the EFI protocols. Um, and that means, essentially, um, if they're not link loaders, they have to rely on the EFI loader itself, and that's going to check a signature. And once we've transitioned to the MOK root of trust, it's not checking the MOK signature, it's still checking this signature in DB. And so it basically means that gummy boot and shim plus mock just don't work. And so what the Linux Foundation did was produce, re-architect our approach to the bootloaders and produce a way of actually trying to get this to work. And our new architecture for secure boot was actually to try and do a plug-in override to the UEFI security protocol itself. The way UEFI platform interfaces work is there is a security protocol whose job is to actually verify the signatures. And the thought behind this was if we can intercept that signature verification and just plug the MOK verification into that chain, 
um, we could actually get um, UEFI itself to validate the kernel instead of, or whatever else you're trying to load, instead of just using DB. And so this effectively allows us to transition the root of security to the MOK variables, even if the link loader is actually using boot services load image. And we actually redesigned the preloader to do this. The problem is here. The overrides are done in EFI Security Arch Protocol, and they changed it again in the second platform interface to be EFI Arch Protocol 2. That theoretically is not part of the EFI spec, the UEFI spec. It's only part of the platform initialization. In practice, I have not yet found a machine this fails on, but in theory, it can fail. The, yeah, there's no guarantee of this whatsoever, as uh, Peter Jones points out. However, there is no other solution to this problem other than something like this. The basic problem with the UEFI is that whoever designed it didn't think in system terms as to how you would actually try to plug into it. And so we need to have a plug-in in order to get BS load image based loaders, which seems to be the way the world is going to actually work. And so the solution that the Linux Foundation came up with is that um, we're going to go to the UEFI board and we're actually just going to propose elevation of Security Arch and Security Arch 2 straight into the EFI spec. I anticipate there'll be a lot of resistance to this, but what we will try and negotiate out of this is just a way of installing the override so we can plug the MOK authentication scheme straight into uh, boot services load image and actually get the ability to override it for everything. So we, if we did it that way, um, I mean, in theory, we could do it that way. The current format of the MOK variables permits that. Um, so it's not an impossible compromise. And actually, one of the um, implementations I did looked very much like that. So we, ha we are prepared for all eventualities. already did in January this year at, so I, what we've finally done is, what's sir? Right, so, but I mean, we've already done some of the pre nobbling The thing we actually have to do is come up with the implementation that's found acceptable to everybody, so that's what we're going to be looking at. The Linux Foundation, um, thanks to some legal issues, finally managed to join the UEFI forum about three weeks ago. And so we will be proposing it through that. Um, you want me to go through how it works, or are you perfectly happy that you, everybody understands this? OK. So probably the best way of doing this is actually to demonstrate the problem. So this is uh, me trying to get everything to work. Um, if I unroll the hash of my loader.efi, which in this system is actually gummy boot, so if I now exit and try and boot gummy boot, that's what gummy boot looks like. And we're going to try and boot the SUSE Linux 3.9 kernel, and this is what happens. That. That's actually a security violation error. Gummy Boot doesn't quite understand it. This means that using the shim approach to try and actually boot Gummy Boot just doesn't work because it cannot load its next stage kernel because the key of the next stage kernel is not the mock key. It would have to be the key in DB. However, there, using the security protocol override, what I can actually do is um, enroll the hash of the so I think it's in Linux. There's the actual VZ Linux for the 3.9 kernel it was trying to boot. If I enroll the hash of that, I can now exit and start Gummy Boot. And Gummy Boot should actually, once it's verified the signature, boot up the kernel. Sorry, I have to apologize for this. Uh, I discovered KVM doesn't work. There we go. In the 3.11 kernel. It's going to crash at the end. 
yeah, come on. I'm t you didn't expect me to implement a complete boot system. But that's a demonstration of what we are discussing of how the security protocol override works. So what we do is we intercept the security hook. We chain the call to the previous protocol, which means we get all the DB and DBX variables. Um, if that succeeds, we just return success because they were validated by the original EFI variables. If that fails, we look up the hash or the signature in the MOK variable and authorize only if the hash is present and the hash is not in DBX. So we basically still obey the Microsoft security policy and then we return. And because this preloader rem remains resident, now the override in EFI until you ex exit boot services also remains resident. And this means that actually I can also, if you looked at my gummy boot, I had the UEFI shell as well. So on all these secure boot machines which have no shell, I can also use this method to actually bring up a shell and use a shell that actually has the MOK variables authorized into it. So I can sign all my own little binaries I want to run with the shell. And it actually makes the machine a much more effective and useful system. Um, gummy boot actually works out of the box now. The couple of patches are actually upstream in it. There's no, I mean, once we allow people to authorize arbitrary UEFI binaries, you cannot prevent them from running the shell. The UEFI shell is actually very useful for debugging purposes. I don't even see why we want to. The shell is prevented from running by default because it's not part of the initial signatures. So someone has to explicitly authorize it, but once the user authorizes it, we allow it. Okay, so I've given you the demonstration, I've given you the discussion, or I've given you my take on this. Is there any discussion about what we're going to try and do? And in theory, we're going to try and unify sort of uh, sh the shim approach and this approach so that we, we can actually use both, right? Yeah, the microphone is somewhere. It's off. How do I switch it on? I know with a switch. OK. Oh, sorry. That was excessive. OK, uh, so the aim is obviously to ensure that we only have one loader to the extent possible, because Linux is about choice. And so uh, I have been sent a bunch of patches by SUSE, and I've been doing some work myself to integrate the code from the LF loader into Shim. This is great in a few ways. It turns out that somehow James is a better UI coder than I am. Which came as a surprise. Yeah. Uh, lovely line art and everything. So that's part of it. Um, so a nice menu system, but also the hooking those functions where possible. The aim here will be to continue with the relocation support, and we'll use that by default. But if anybody tries to call load image or start image, it will also then fall back to the hooked versions. Uh, and That's to mitigate the problem of it's not there. Right. Um, so since we can't guarantee that that functionality is there, we're going to continue with the relocator and loader that we ship. Uh, so that way we cover all bases. On systems where it is possible to then use gummy boots, you'll be able to use gummy boots. And on systems where it's impossible to use gummy boot, well, it just turns out it's impossible. To. That's a clue in the name. So far, we've, we have done a bit of testing of all the UEFI BIOSes. I have not found one where I can't use the architectural security protocol mm -hmm. override. So it, it looks like we're reasonably safe. It's that anyone based on yeah. Tiano is likely to nope. have. Even you know, the non Tiano ones. I mean, so we tried it with the, I think it's the Acer BIOS is non Tiano based, is it? Right. Uh, the cases where I would expect there to be problems will generally be interesting embedded systems. Uh, for instance, if you have, if you're using core boot and then an EFI payload, the PI code will not be there. The core boot will have been doing that job instead. But you know, that's into a niche case. In general, this should work correctly. And so I have no problem merging yep. it. So the only real obstacle to actually making this work is trying to get EFI to see the world from our point of view, yep. which Ideally, is what we will be trying we to do will. next. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in terms of, basically, that's just a move that chunk of the spec from one document to another document. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
if they're going to, so the way I'm using the architectural security protocol override, I'm not sure is even allowed by the PI spec. It allows you to get at the protocol, but it doesn't actually define what happens when you override it. That's easy enough, yeah. So we think we know what we need to do, and we'll have a run at DFI once we manage to put our proposals together. Uh, but, so the only reason that this code isn't completely unified already is just that I have been kind of busy having a job. Yeah. So uh, that's great. Well, I talked to Mark Doran, yes. At least I've. Well, But I talked to Mark just because that's the channel we were going through for the EFI stuff. Um, if we can, so Intel's having this um, get together at the end of the month. The Intel Technology Day is actually the beginning of next month. We might be able to get some of the EFI people to turn up and have a quiet little meeting in the corner because we'll all be in Portland. And so we might, that there's resistance coming to, I mean, I, I'm trying to put this diplomatically. Um, the way that the UEFI spec is written and the way that UEFI people think is it's sort of this single, ch single tunnel. And once you sort of try and burrow out of the tunnel, there seems to be a lot of resistance to changing it. So we're going to have to do politics as well as technical arguments. But I, I think the, yeah, that's <laughs> the basic thing that we want, which I believe we can get the UEFI guys to line up behind, is that we want to use boot services, load image, to load images. And, but we also want to transition the root of trust, the MOK variables. This is our proposal for doing that. Don't like it. Tell us how you'd like it done. And, and it's not something we're not already doing. We're already doing everything the same. So we're yeah. Doing it in a stupid way. Yeah. We implement a link loader in our bootloader, which is completely pointless since EFI possess. I mean, actually. Yeah. I, and actually, if we're going to go after that, we could also take all of the um, encryption stuff from UEFI as well. None of the encryption protocols is exposed in UEFI, and they bloody well should be, because we have a case for... The, the reason why the LF loader is so small is because I don't link it with SSL, so it can only verify hashes, because that's the only function I built into it. But in theory, all of that functionality is present in EFI, just not exposed. If it were all exposed, uh, we could all attach to it and not bother about all these license problems we have with SSL and other things. Yeah, it's and that's a megabyte of stuff. It's completely stupid. So there's a lot more we need. And this, this comes from sort of, I, I think the UFI seems to be, or the secure boot stuff seems to be written with one use case in mind. And a lot of it's not exposed. So we'll start with the security protocol override. But I think the ultimate goal is just getting more of this functionality out so we can thin down our bootloaders even further. OK, so that was the gist of my presentation. Any further discussion from people who aren't Peter? So everybody understands what we're trying to do? Is that a hand raised or are you just stretching? Yeah, it's not present. <laughs> but remember, secure boot is an optional feature. So what you're asking is, are we going to make it an optional feature of an optional feature? <laughs> we can't make it a mandatory feature of an optional feature. Yeah, we're just going to try and elevate it to the UEFI spec. Um, and by the way, that's not a, a we. That's a who's the LF uh, UEFI rep again? Uh, would you care to stick your hand up? That's you. Then you're going to be doing it. <coughs> We have to lobby for it, so we have to indulge in politics. Oh my God! Well, so so the, the, there are two answers to your question. There's the political answer, and there's the practical answer. The practical answer is it's effectively in production already. 
done. The political answer is it's probably going to take us a year, possibly a couple of years, to get this through UEFI. Yeah. presentation mode. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we solve all. That. That's why the security architecture override is so good because it does. There are. I've seen biases that do really horrible and stupid things. So yeah, it prevents a lot of that. I mean, obviously, the BIOS could still be constructed wrongly. You could pop up the box immediately after you've done the signature check. <laughs> So we know it works on all the machines I've tested, but hopefully there's a much broader range in one of the rooms around here that we can test later on with this little USB key I have. I don't disagree. Any other questions? Okay, move on to the next one.